Welcome. Today we're going to talk about Information Doesn't Want to be Free by Cory Doctorow, which kind of plays off the famous line that information wants to be free, and he would say it absolutely doesn't. So buckle up, let's figure out what he says in this book and if you should read it. Before we get there, though, I want to let you know there's two ways to support the channel. Number one is to go to patreon.com slash curtismchale, support the channel. Number two is to go to curtismchale.ca slash skillshare. And right now you can take my course on TickTick and watch for my upcoming course on time blocking. Buckle up. One of the big distinctions that Doctor makes in his book is that there's two, I guess there's two types of freedom is what he says. And one is the actual paid freedom of uh, information. He was said information paid does not want to be free. That information, like people will pay for information. They will pay for knowledge. But he also really strongly thinks that information should be free as in like once you have it, you should be able to do what you want with it. So no DRM, no software locks. None of that stuff. He equates DRM software locks with malware many times, citing the famous Sony um, rootkit they installed on your computer to keep their songs um, locked up. And that would be early 2000s, maybe late 90s, but you know, it's been a while now. And really most, and all DRM is about lock-in. It's not about making sure the user has any freedom whatsoever. So one quote, we'll use a quote from him to talk about this. It says, if I'm your audience and I spent a uh, thousand bucks on my movie library, I don't want to have to throw it away, throw away that investment. I want to be able to use one family of devices and one program to manage my movies. It actually made me think of why I've stopped purchasing movies from Apple because even if I, I could purchase a movie, it's paid for. I've owned it for years. And then my credit card, because use a Visa debit, um, cause I spend money <laughs> and that helps stop me from spending too much money. Um, but if it defaults for any reason whatsoever, I can no longer watch any movie I purchased from Apple until I fix it. So like, like they literally lock me out of stuff I've already purchased because something else, say uh, Epic for kids, which is like Netflix kids books. Um, if that purchase defaults for $6, I can't watch a movie I bought five years ago until I go fix that problem. And that is totally not about convenience for me in any fashion. That's all about like lock in, making sure that they get whatever and being a pain in the butt. That's it's all, it's a pain in the butt. That is why I buy DVDs and Blu-rays and rip them now. And I spent a number of hundreds of dollars on a drive that lets me do that. Like region unlock. Cause that's the other thing I can't do regularly. I can't purchase the anime that I want to watch in Canada in a whatever zone we are um, compatible DVD. And I have to purchase it from Japan uh, and I can only watch it on a region unlocked or device. And that's just like, it's all about lock-in. It has nothing to do with consumer choice. He actually cites an interesting study in there too that says um, basically piracy of US TV shows in Europe is really high until people can purchase it and then it basically drops away. There's like almost no piracy after that. So what that really means is People just want the stuff to watch. And if you're not going to give it to them, they're going to find it. And as soon as you make it available to purchase, they're going to pay you for it. And it's only like the very small percentage that are of people that are just going to keep pirating this, this information anyways. He also has a interesting quote from Tim O'Reilly that goes more to people trying to, I guess, get into an industry, people trying to build a creative following. And it says, obscurity is far greater threat to authors and creative artists than piracy. So basically, like, don't chase down the piracy because you're, the bigger concern is that nobody knows who you are, not that someone's, you know, taken two copies of your book. So just don't worry about it. I certainly never have. I give away my book all the time. I'm sure if you look around, you can find some of my books for free, and I don't even care. And one of the big things that Dr. O talks about in this book is that the lack of platform diversity means that creators are locked in and have no say over their creative material. So even most people are watching this on YouTube. And in fact, everyone's watching this on YouTube and I'm basically at YouTube's whim. So at the end, I'm going to tell you, Hey, you know, subscribe and do all that. But YouTube may or may never, not ever should tell you that a movie came out, a video came out. Someone could take exception to my channel and create a bunch of, you know, say spurious copyright strikes against me. And I literally have no recourse. It's in YouTube's interest really to just take my, content down, shut my channel down, and I can do nothing about it. Because it is on me to prove that I didn't do it, and there's actually no cost to the person making the claims. No, it doesn't matter who they are, in fact. 
and that's just a pain in the butt. Like, I have no choice but to use YouTube in that respect because the cost of video hosting, right? YouTube essentially owns the audience that I have. I don't own the audience, which is why you could subscribe at curtismichael.ca slash subscribe, which helps give me some ownership over the audience, um, like a personal relationship with them, right? You see this in Apple too, right? Is the epic debacle uh, as how they treat developers many times where they just like shut their accounts down for no known reason. Um, happened with Downey recently, a uh, good YouTube downloading app. Uh, a good video downloading app, mainly YouTube for me. And the developer just like, I don't know, I just woke up and Apple said all my stuff was spam and my account was shut down. Or there was a guy recently and his he was taken off because he was saying, or they said that he was a copy of someone else's app. And he was like, no, 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 all the apps are copies of my app. And Apple, he had to like fight Apple and find a way to even possibly get them to listen to him. And then that decision got reversed. And so like the platform lock-in makes the creator's life so much harder, right? Kindle books is another one, right? It's about platform lock-in on Kindle. It's not about me being able to use the book. I've got one book and it says, oh, you have it on too many Kindle devices. So I can't read this book anymore because I have too many Kindles. I don't know. There's like five people in my family. We've got right a couple iPads that are registered for Kindle, a couple iPhones that are registered for Kindle, a couple actual Kindles that my kids would use as well. And my one daughter has it. So we have like 10 devices maybe. I have it on my Mac too. So, like, it's certainly not advantageous to me in any way. It's another reason that I have, you know, you can't see them, but you can see some on my back shelf here, but I have, you know, 250, like, physical books because you literally, they're mine. What what are you going to do? I could just give them away after, and nobody can stop me. I actually talked about that in, um, oh, what was it, a library book. Not the library book. That's a different book. Um... I'll have to put a link, put something right here because I'll figure it out after where this actually affects libraries too because they used to be able to buy a book and they can do whatever they want after. Whereas now the digital copies have to keep repaying licenses. So book costs went way up for them and the creators don't see any of this money really. It's the distribution houses that see it. Um, And that makes it a lot harder for libraries to continue to move forward because they have to again repurchase a new copy when a new format comes out. They can't just convert it right? So all the books, like I have, actually, I buy a bunch of books off my library when they sell them and they can just sell them and make money off it. And I like their digital copies. I can't do anything with. So digital locks only add are only advantageous for the platform vendor. They're really not advantageous for the creator. As far as I'm concerned, like I've had people buy it on Kindle and they're like, oh, I can't get it on this or that. And I just send them a PDF copy of the book. I don't say, don't even vet the, don't even check. I just say, oh, here you go. Here's a PDF copy. Here's an EPUB. Here's any format you want. Have a good day. And I don't care because I'd rather just have someone get to see my material. So as always, my last question is, should you read Information Doesn't Want to Be Free by Cory Doctorow? I would say this is an average book. Uh, Like, average three stars then for me. It's average. It's fine. Uh, it is interesting if you want to read more about digital locks, about copyright, about, you know, how platform vendors do lock-in. I wouldn't say it's a must-read, though. It's a good book, but it's not a must read. If you want to support the channel, thumbs up below. If you liked the video, loved it, so that's the thumbs up. If you really loved it and you subscribe and hit the bell and maybe, possibly, once in a while, YouTube will let you know I did a video. And if you want to support the channel, you go to uh, patreon.com slash Curtis McHale, or you can go to Skillshare. I always want to say Skillshare, but no, it's curtismichael.ca slash Skillshare. Take my course on TickTick, my task manager of choice. Watch my upcoming course on time blocking. I'm usually streaming Fridays at some point for my time blocking research as well. Have an excellent day.